Turk's cat lily, compass plant, Verona castrum. I'm standing in the middle of one of the last vestiges of the great American prairies. Uh, this is a very potent landscape. It's a landscape which I've dreamed about seeing and it's what the first American settlers would have been faced with when they arrived here and it would have rolled on for mile upon mile, acre upon acre of the Midwest and it's a landscape which in the last few years has inspired a few landscape architects and garden designers. Omi and Van Sweden are the biggest and most successful firm to have used the magic and wildness of the prairie. This tends to appeal to wealthy suburban America. I'm keen to meet them to discover how they have managed to translate the prairie to the suburbs. This is a typical townhouse uh, neighborhood of Washington. Uh, these happen to be new houses, but they're designed in the uh, in the vernacular of the uh, Capitol Hill area. Mm. <laughs> Scenes in America. We all want an English lawn, no matter how, how big. <laughs> and obviously these people did. And then like a lamp on a table, they put this weeping cherry. You would never ever do this, would you? We would never no, do this. Never do this. No. When you see a lot of azaleas, people love azaleas because the color is so bright and mm. spring, spring mm. color. We're famous for hating azaleas. Oh, yeah. We always take them out. <laughs> But this is you on the corner? Oh yes, this is... It's us on the corner. We did this garden about four years ago, and here you see we've treated the ground plane as a kind of painting. Mm -hmm. I love the Hakanakloa with allium. Yellowish grass. That's another very distinctive yeah, thing that, that you've, beautiful you've golden done, color. isn't it, allium above? Allium above. There's another story. Right. right. Above things. Right. Designing in layer. layers. Yeah. It works. Good afternoon, Irma van Sweden and Associates. So this is ago. typical of a planting plan we do. It looks like a kind of crazy quilt. Right. And uh, each of these areas shown here, of course, is one plant. And we show 55 chalone in that area. Right, so but, you're working uh, with big quantities yeah. of things. And one of the things about your planting, it's got a very strong look yeah. to it. Very unusual for landscape yeah. architects. Mm. We have a very, very uh, involved plant palette, and also the way we use plants is unique, mm. in mm. the United States at least. James is taking me to see one of their most characteristic prairie plantings. The Gwaltney Garden is 15 acres, and uh, the part that we designed is about four. Do you think that your gardens work on a big scale best? I mean, to me, they seem very much about America and wide open landscapes. I think from the standpoint of America, yes. Mm. They, they do have that feeling of the, the meadow and the prairie. Of course, they're metaphors for yeah. uh, the me American meadow. We're going to turn left again. Because when they come to us, that's what they want. They want a kind of natural, meadow-like garden. It's the way we handle the plants very, in a very dramatic way and, and uh, emphasize scale of leaves and textures and, yeah. and mostly the color green, really. Enjoying the fruit of your labours. <laughs> it's 
It's interesting here because the pool itself brings the bay right up to the house. Normally we don't put a swimming pool this close to the house or in the view. We put it off to the side. But in this case it works because it brings the, the bay right up and the sky right up into this, this part of the uh, terrace, the deck. And it acts as beautiful. This deck is a wonderful horizontal plane which then drops down three steps to the lawn, which is another great plane, and then down to the level of the water, which is another six feet below that. I think it's interesting that this rather fragile looking uh, grass here at the far edge of the terrace uh, is, it's calamagrostis, but it looks so delicate. It will take winds of Anything. 90 to 110. It's always perfect. It'll be perfect in the winter. It's an amazing... Uh, Even with snow or anything, it stands yeah. up. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. I love the Miscanthus giganteus against the woods. Yeah. It's very pretty. And notice how it's repeated. Repeated from, on the other side. This side, mm. this whole sweep. Mm. So the planting is like these huge waves, isn't it, that sweep around the building? Yes. Yeah. And this is this is very typical of your plantings, isn't it? Having these big repeat groups repeat, of yeah. grasses. Yes. Right. Distance. It's distance. a good scale yeah. uh, for that distant view. Right. It uh, speaks. <laughs> mm. The heights vary as well, so that you have uh, this drama between the low, low and, and, and taller. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we're designing in every dimension, including time, mm. third dimension. Yeah. And uh, time, because this changes so totally uh, from summer to fall. And in the spring, it's all bulbs, hundreds of thousands of daffodils blooming. And now you don't even see them. <laughs> Nobody used glasses. No. We were the first ones to use glasses. Yes. Do you think yes. people will get um, will get tired of the grasses? I don't think so. You don't. Because no. I think yes. it's something certainly that um, you could say that it was a, a fashion, couldn't yeah, you? Yeah. Uh, fashions like move more slowly through yeah, horticulture, right. and I just wonder whether because it's such a yeah. there's such a strong look, whether people will actually decide right. at some point whether or not they want something. Uh, you never know, of course. We have to keep using them in new yeah. ways. In new <laughs> ways. That's the key. Yeah, I, I think that's possible. Yeah. Mm. People were all taken by it. They, they wanted more and more and more. Mm. Mm. Because of the scale, and they yeah. wanted the big scale. And the showy look, as you say. <laughs> yes. One of the things I wanted to see was in Omi and Van Sweden, a small garden. So. James has brought me to Barbara Bonningwood Woods Garden, and um, you're going to show me around. Take a look. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's see if we can interrupt these ladies. We're having a glass of water. Excuse us. Could uh, can I show the garden a minute? Do you mind? <laughs> the interesting thing about this garden is it's long. It's narrow and deep. It's 85 feet deep and 17 feet wide. Mm. So it was important to layer the space going back, so yes. you get that feeling of mystery. One of the interesting things here is that you haven't planted the hedges, you, the fences you've actually planted in front of them. And loads of people would feel that they've got to screen their neighbours out. Right, which and, uh, then would make it more like a wall yeah. and make it seem even narrower. Yeah, and these grasses are brilliant, aren't they? Because you've almost used them in the way that people might use a shrub. Yes, um, but it's much looser. And... Yeah. Oh, look at the light on this now. Mm. The light's beautiful. Oh, this is perfect light for photographing mm. gardens. Mm. Oh, isn't that wonderful? One of the Omeon van Sweden signatures is the way that they use their plants. So that in this garden, the way that they've coped with the relatively small space is to use their plants in a way that you might place big pieces of furniture in a room and very confidently and used to break the space up rather than using hard structures. And that is really what has made this garden work. It's very graceful, it's very soft. Um, there's a real feeling of verdance. James tried out this new kind of planting with grasses in his own garden first, and he's invited me to see it tonight. It's 
what lovely when you come through the house and you've got these great big windows and it just completely fills the end wall of the kitchen. Yes, it's 17 feet wide mm -hmm. and 55 feet deep. So it's tiny. It's, it's very small. Yeah. And the beauty of it, I think, is that it's, it's gently tilted as it goes back. Mm. It tilts slightly. And also it's up uh, five steps. So mm. when you're seated in the kitchen, you're looking at the garden at eye level, like uh, which makes it very nice. Mm. Right? The grasses are wonderful as well, aren't they? Because they capture all the movement. Yes. And this miscanthus at the back. This miscanthus you be aware of this gentle breeze, would you, unless that was there? No, that's right. And they make a very nice sound. What I really like about your gardens is that they're just very potent. Oh, and, thank you. and having that sculpture there, it would be very tempting to put something in that was smaller. And the fact that it's so huge. Yes. In this small space is, is, is good. It's fun as well, isn't it's it? Very, it's like kind of like a moon. I wanted to know where your inspiration came from for the style that you have, which is really very distinctive. You can spot in only in Ben Sweden Garden very easily. Well, I think uh, in my case it came from uh, growing up in the Middle West of the United States, running across the meadows and prairies and the dunes of Lake Michigan. Mm. And also, I think what's important is that Wolfgang and I come at it from two different sides. Wolfgang from horticulture, mm -hmm. and I come at it from architecture, because I was an architect first. Mm. Wolfgang, a horticulturist first. Mm. And so we meet in the middle. Mm. And we're not, we're not geniuses, but I think it is a partnership of genius. I've just spent the last couple of days with Wolfgang and James, and uh, it's been really quite overwhelming because what I've seen is, is big and confident. And what they've done is they've taken a very simple idea, really, and they've blown it up in that American way. It's great to see something like that, as successful as it is, but I'm looking forward now to going on to looking a bit further afield, at something which is maybe a little bit more hands-on. to meet a group of people who are environmentalists in Milwaukee and they are called the Wild Ones and they've used the prairie as a source of inspiration and working on a small scale to try and recreate an essence of a great lost American landscape. Prairie is not always welcomed in suburban America. Brett Rappaport is president of the Wild Ones. They're not garden designers, just passionate about creating the look and the atmosphere of the prairies. It's an ambition that I've heard can create problems. And these lawns out here are relentless, aren't they, in America? Exactly, exactly. Mm. The whole American ethic is, is built on a sense of conquest of nature and dominance. And uh, as we turned into suburbia after World War II, that ethic uh, translated into what I call the lawn ethic, which is this idea that I am master of my domain and I am going to have this closely cropped lawn, no weeds, no grubs, no anything. It's, it's going to show that I'm here. And most cities and, and counties have um, weed laws that say you cannot have weeds in excess of 10 inches or 12 inches. They're basically designed for negligent homeowners who don't care and just let their yards become overgrown. Mm. But we've argued that this is not a uh, unkempt yard. It's not a negligent homeowner who doesn't care. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It is a purposeful, intentional um, landscaping. It's just a different kind of gardening. Brett sent me on to see Laurie Otto. She founded the Wild Ones 25 years ago. The whole movement began after she was prosecuted by her neighbors for planting prairie grasses and plants in her own front yard. You can see already that her little plot here is completely different from everybody's clipped and manicured frontages that we've passed on the way here. It used to be that to feel safe, you had to destroy everything. The, the, the Indians would sneak Control. up, or um, 
someone would come steal your cattle or whatever it was. So you, so you cleared the landscape around your house. So in the beginning, to be bare around you was to be safe. Now, to be bare around you is frightening. Mm. It's frightening. In the beginning, we said anything. Anything but a lawn. Mm. As long as we didn't have to use our precious drinking water on it, as long as we didn't have to use any chemicals, as long as we didn't have to destroy another spot to make our spot go. There's some lovely things in here. Well, you see, this is the early bloom. There's um, flowering spurge. That's the white. That's the white over there. That's the white over there, yeah. yes. And is this and then, bergamot, Laurie? Yes, that's bergamot, uh-huh. Yeah. And, and this uh, is the echinacea. Yes, there. Pallida. Yeah, and these are the... Those that... are just Black-Eyed Susans, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people are doing it in their back. Because it's more discreet. That's right, and, and we really say to people, you know, if, if you are a little wary about doing this, practice in your backyard, and then do it in the front. Show it off, you know, celebrate where we live. It's my last day in the Midwest, and I'm going to spend it on a grand tour of the yards planted by the Milwaukee chapter of the Wild Ones. First stop is Ray's yard. There's some things here which um, I recognize from, um, from home, things that we use in, in a herbaceous border. Oh, like which ones? The um, Veronicastrum, oh, the okay. spiky, and the Echinacea. Uh -huh. Are these Coreopsis here? Yes. Yeah. OK. And the Liatris. That's... Yeah. Isn't this going to be a wonderful it's club? It's going to be good as Now, well. last year, the deer ate this, too. It's just amazing. They pick different things different years. Yeah, but this is going to be beautiful. I hope that just when it buds, they don't just kind of stop by and pop in. And um, these are spiderwort. I don't know. Well, let's see. Some of them Chodis, will probably be out. Yeah. Through, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you know all those names. And as far as anything else we don't I don't do anything I cut down the stalks in the spring and we rake it up real good because you can't fire it like. we cannot fire mm. no burning in Bayside one neighbor once said to me I, I hate this so much I'm going to drop my cigarette right here and I said yes do it in the spring <laughs> you know that's what I need is a good fire and a reason for the fire because what does the, the fryer in the prairie would have actually just burned off all the thatch. Right, right. It burns off all that. It gives it that new life, you know, and mm. then some of the seeds. It also does some breaking up of seeds. Too, breaking so dormancy. Right, mm. yeah. This is the America of the velvet lawn and the lawn is the fitted carpet of this part of America. And if I was a teenager, I think I would truly go completely mad here. I think I'd go mad here now. So for me, it's great to see this lawn being taken up. And what these people are doing here is really quite an anarchic act. Power to them. You know he was getting a farmer. <laughs> this is the part you're supposed to wear gloves for. My husband would divorce me. Really? Got a beautiful seed head. Blue lobelia. Some some ferns. But it does take a lot of nerve. <laughs> it does take nerve. <laughs> to do this. But it you notice the neighbors start to come out. Yeah. And they say, oh, you have this many people helping you? This is why this is good. The wild ones not only do the digging, but bring along plants from their own gardens as well. You're the brave one. I'm the brave one. Well, I, no, it's not that I'm brave. It's just that what an what a opportunity. I mean, they asked me, could they use my house? And they said, it's not going to cost you a thing. You're not going to have to do anything. I said, sure, it sounds pretty good to me. Well, you keep calling it a prairie, though, but we really don't have buffalo running through the front yard, so yeah. we like to sneak up on people by calling it a butterfly habitat garden, you know. 
and uh, that seems to go over better than scaring people and saying we're bringing a prairie to the suburbs, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's nice to see it happen so rapidly as well, isn't it? Well, overnight. It's like overnight. It's like um, the women's magazines with the makeover. You know, you're supposed to be <laughs> totally different the next day. Well, this is, Here it is. the makeover of the yard. <laughs> Dan, would you like to come look at my yard? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would be lovely. You're far from here, Michelle? No, no, not at all. And it's uh, a nice little short ride. Do you know what this was originally? This was an apple orchard with apple trees and Miriam bluegrass. And I decided to naturalize. It's a rich environment, isn't it? That's what you immediately feel when you look at uh, what people mostly do with their gardens. You've changed it into something which is actually very dynamic. It must always be changing. That's true, that's true. I love the fact that the, the plants are taller than I am, you know, and you get a feeling of where you are in nature. Are all these things uh, American natives? Yes, this is oh, this, fabulous. This is amazing. Isn't, isn't it? this terrific? It's really beautiful. Uh, and it's just so Matisse like. Uh, just wonderful. And this is again, the compass plant. Yes, and it's a night. Look at the wonderful texture and uh, reaching to the sky, and it turns with the light. Oh, are they over there now? They're, they're really loud. This is typical landscaping in the United States. We know that we have healed a certain part of the earth. We can't do everything, but we know that we could start where we are. I will. I will. Good having you. Bye See bye. You. Have a safe trip. I've just been thinking about what I've seen with the Wild Ones and what they're trying to create there is something which has been lost a long time ago and their little patches which they're putting so much passion into are very special and, um, and I was very, very impressed by it. Their enthusiasm is taken to a point, almost a sort of a religious point, and I expect that they're needing that because Milwaukee, from what I saw of it, was a very sterile environment. It was a place which was completely controlled by the hand of man, and this was one way in which they could actually create something which had a life and a pace of its own, somewhere that was a world in itself. I'm off now to see another classic and yet completely different American landscape, the desert and the west coast. That's what? Oh yeah, mosquitoes are coming. 